be solid, to be aware. And uh, <clears throat> so often uh, it's like, am I able to, to withstand the different things that come against me or would, uh, would be uh, in my life? Am I able to withstand and to be solid? And I want you to know that absolutely <clears throat> the Lord would have us be solid. And depending on how much time I have or how far I get, uh, I'm going to maybe wrap up with a solid part of it. I've been starting with a solid part uh, and then heading into the beware part, be aware. But uh, tonight I'm going to start with the be aware part as we continue on in this series. If you've missed any of these, uh, we are uh, part four of a, uh, uh, I thought it would be just a one or two part series, but I'll tell you right now, there is no way that I'll be finishing tonight. You've heard that, because, uh, yeah. And as part of this, I, I didn't think I would get so deeply into this, uh, this aspect of being aware of these last days and the things that are, are happening, and it is amazing, this is right on. This word was given almost 2,000 years ago to Paul to write to the young pastor, Timothy, and that message is for me, as Paul, by the Holy Spirit, would speak to me to warn you of these last days. And what is happening at these, in this time? And it is right on. It is exactly on. So I want to read the verses 1 to 3, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 3. And uh, we're going to focus in on uh, this sixth point that I want to make. And made a number of points uh, over the course of the last three weeks. And so this is part four of Be Solid, Be Aware. And it has to do with... Uh, relationships with others, uh, specifically marriage, okay? 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in latter times, and we're talking about even in these times, especially in these times, some will depart from the faith. And I'm seeing that happening. I see people departing from the faith. Believers departing from the faith. Why? Because they are giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And this is happening in this day, in these last days, where there, is a de there are deceiving spirits. We're talking demons and doctrines of demons that are, are being heeded by the believer to the point where they are, are leaving the faith. Some of them may not even be aware of it. And we have entire denominations that are allowing these doctrines of demons to come in to their, not just their church, but to into entire denomination. There, and, and there's a <clears throat> moving away or a splitting and a dividing of denominations. And it's regarding these things. And it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy. So as they heed these deceiving spirits and these doctrines of demons, they will speak lies and hypocrisy. They'll say, hey, don't do this, or go ahead and do this, and... And, but there's a hypocrisy about it. They're not, even, they're not following those things, but they're leading others astray. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Some of them not knowing that what they're doing is not right. Others knowing full well what they are doing is not right. And they're, because their conscience is seared, they're continuing on that route. Deceiving others. And oftentimes it is those that are in positions of leadership that are doing this. It says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. 
So it's coming against those that would believe and know the truth. And uh, so there's these different doctrines that are coming in. Tonight, I want to focus on this aspect of forbidding to marry. Now, forbidding means to prohibit or hinder or oppose or operate against marriage. Let me say again. This forbidding means to prohibit or hinder or oppose or operate against the, this concept of marriage. They're opposed to it. So the seducing spirits will influence people to hinder those that would desire marriage or there, there's an opposing to the aspect of marriage by enticing them to meet the demands of the sex drive apart from the sanctity of marriage. Let me say that again and tell me if that's not the case today, even within the church, where there's an influence by these seducing spirits, these demons that will influence people to operate or go against the thing of marriage by enticing them to meet the demands of the sex drive apart or an outside of the sanctity of marriage. These things, these sex needs are through perversions and contrary to what is approved by Scripture. And basically, there is a, this influence, this control, more or less, of demons, seducing spirits. And we are talking here within even the church, within the body of Christ. Wow. This applies also to religions that discourage or forbid marriage to anyone among laymen or clergy. So the, the influence would be don't get or don't be married. And it has caused great harm in some denominations, large denominations, where there's sexual perversions that take place where there have been who knows how many people hurt as a result of it. Now, I, uh, I didn't expect to be going as deeply as I would into this, but uh, there was a number of passages that I w w was led to. And I, I just want to say this. May I say this? And I, I, I want for you to know, if you are in that place or were in that place or even as you might be listening online at this point, I want you to know that God loves you. May not love. In fact, God does not love sin, but he does love the sinner. And I want you to know that if you were in that place or are in that place and you're not where you should be at when it comes to the sexual aspect of your being, that God is saying to you that you can make things right within your life, that you can be in a place of right standing with God. I think sometimes we look back at our past or we may even look at where we are at right now and you say, how can I get out of this? Nobody knows about it or maybe other, there might be some that may know where you are at and you know that you're not right before the Lord and you're saying, Does, will God forgive me? And I want to say right up front that God can forgive you as you go to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin, whether it's in the past whether, or it's in the present. 
Lord, forgive me of my sin. You might say, Pastor, there's temptations that I have. I think one of the greatest temptations, in fact, in Scripture, talks about sexual temptation. It says, run. You might say, why don't we resist sexual temptation? Anybody? Why do we run from sexual temptation rather than resisting it? Anybody? Sorry? Okay, if you don't run away from it, it's going to come back and, and haunt you. Okay. Somebody else, the temptation. Why do you not resist? It says to resist the devil and he will flee from you. But when it comes to sexual temptation, it says to run. To run from it. Why is that? Okay, so the weakness of the flesh. But why eight? Hey, there's many different sins. The God says resist the devil. He'll flee from you. The temptations, we can resist. We can, no. Why do we run from sexual temptation? We, we don't even dabble with it at all. Why not? It's not, it's not a trick question. Because you can sin in thoughts. Okay, so our, our thoughts. And uh, so taking captive thoughts. Uh, not playing. Because, yeah, so much of the, the aspect of sex is right up here in our heads. So this needs to be shut down immediately. Why do we run? Let me just tell you why we run. Who created us to be sexual beings. Sorry? It was God. And God created us as sexual beings in that this one thing should be within the confines of marriage. It needs to be within marriage. So when it's happening and it's outside of marriage, it is something that you do not toy with. You need to run. And there's this, this wooing, if you would, when it comes to sexual temptation that, that is very insidious. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a thing that, that, that we, we will attempt to possibly do in the secret, in the hidden, nobody else watching. And it's, there's something going on in our head that we need to shut down immediately. So, if you're not married, to say, I need to maintain a purity before the Lord until marriage. Is there temptation? Yes. There, there will be temptation. We, we flee to that temptation. We look, Lord, I'm looking to you in this. I'm going to run to you. If you... If you are married and there's temptation outside, you need to shut it down. Don't even play with a thought. It's amazing how we can, uh, the, the thoughts that come to us, and we know there are thoughts that come of the flesh. There are thoughts that come of, of this world. They're presented by this world. And there are thoughts that are, are coming even demonically. We're talking about the, the heating, seducing, seducing, seduction. There's this, this thing of, of, that is coming against us and we need to run. We need to heat we, or we need to shut this down. If there is a demonic uh, aspect to it, it is in Jesus' name. I bind those foul spirits in Jesus' name to not continue on with going down that path. When it, when, it, uh, when it has to do with our thoughts, taking thoughts that are not in obedience to Christ, we can take them captive in Jesus' name. If it is demonic, and it's very demonic in nature, and there's a plaguing, it says they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. 
I overcome the demonic influences by the blood of the Lamb. So there's a confession of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And it says, and by the word of their testimony. So there's a speaking out. A testimony is this is what I am saying and I'm believing in my heart. This is, the, my, this is testimony. Jesus Christ and him crucified for me to overcome the, the, even the demons that would try to seduce. I overcome. I, I, I not just resist, but I, I flee the thought. I flee. I, sh I shut them down. I do not um, continue on that that those thought that that path of of thought, a train of thought. Question. So it's not just one person, it takes two people when it comes to the, the final act. But there's oftentimes there's already stuff happening before that, way before that, that is not even involving another person. It's even the thoughts and, and uh, entertaining the thoughts of somebody that is you're not married to or it's even before marriage and there's thoughts that start to enter into the mind and we need to shut those down immediately. All right. So I want to go to... Matthew chapter 19, I want to go through from verse 1 to 12 or so, uh, or more, and I see that something is, has been cut off here in my notes, and I'm hoping that, okay, I got two sides here, that's why I'm, all right, went to two-sided, all right, here we go. So, Matthew 19, verse 1, and there was a, a, an attempt to trap Jesus. And so, I'll, I just, we'll go through this quickly. We'll stop and pause at a few spots along the way. Now, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, this for just any reason, um, they had gotten to a point, the Pharisees, where um, they, were, they were saying, you know what, if, you're, if your wife uh, didn't cook the meal properly, you know, it's, it, she does, she's struggling in that area, you, you know, you have an opportunity to divorce. You know, or there's another, uh, you know, their hair wasn't done properly. They, you have an opportunity to divorce. Uh, there's another woman that comes along that's better. You know, you think, well, my, I, I, I prefer this other woman over my, I, I might, you know what, I can divorce. So the reasoning, for just any reason, and right off the bat, this is, a, this is Jesus talking now. And it, it immediately... Jesus' view on evolution is answered in this question, or in this uh, answer to this question of divorce. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Right off at the beginning. So there was no evolution that took place. God created male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And so they thought, oh, we're going to trap Jesus. We've got him trapped now. And they said, uh, he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Now he, he gives parameters to divorce. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So, 
You get it? If you divorce your wife just for, uh, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Now, there's one other thing that he mentioned as well, and error is mentioned in Scripture. If a spouse chooses to leave their partner, say, hey, I don't want anything to do with you, that the one that is left behind has opportunity then to remarry, but otherwise commits adultery. Now, some of you may have been in a position where this actually took place. You say, oh, I don't really like this person and, and uh, for, uh, for whatever reason. And it, maybe it didn't have to do with immorality or being sexually unfaithful by the other person because that's the grounds that he gives. And so you were in a place where you say, you know what? I married somebody that uh, I married someone else uh, that was divorced and uh, there was no reason for this uh, sexually or because of sexual immorality. And so you examine yourself and say, oh my goodness, where am I at? And I, I, I want to say right now, especially for those that this may have happened while you were not a believer, just say, Lord, I didn't know. Forgive me. Forgive me of my sin at this point. If it was as believers, this thing of the hardness because of hardness of heart, there would be confession of your sin. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of this decision that I have made because of hardness of heart. It was the wrong thing. Forgive me. A broken and contrite spirit and heart the Lord does not despise. To come before the Lord, Lord, forgive me. So, his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Now, this next part, Jesus answers, and it's like, you know what? I, 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 I wanted to stop at 10, and it just, it hit me. There's conversation in the last week, and it was regarding this thing of, I'm born a certain way or there's been changes in my life physically because of where I'm thinking or what I'm thinking. Listen to this. He goes, Jesus talks for a few verses about a eunuch. But he said to them, all cannot accept this saying when it comes to if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Let's not get married. All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given to be single. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Now, the one aspect of or definition of eunuch has to do physically with, with the male castration. It's like, so let me just read this again. All cannot accept the saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb. So they, they, that's how they were born. There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. So other men caused them to be eunuchs. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. In this case, they're saying, you know what? I'm purposely not going to marry. I'm going to focus and concentrate on the, the work of the Lord. And so for them, it's a decision that they make. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Now, 
I want to jump to Acts 8, 34, because we have the story of a eunuch. Because sometimes when there's a, a mutilating that takes place, there's a question, does God, will God accept me? I like what it says in 1 Corinthians 6. It says, and such were some of you. And it talks about those that are, when it comes to sexually being, uh, hey, in this day and age, you, you do what you want to do, right? In this world, you go ahead and do what you want to do. However, before the Lord God, he is saying there are parameters that you just can't do. You can do them in this world. and You want to do it, that's fine. But when it comes to standing before me, these are things that are unacceptable. And I like what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, I think it's verse 9, 10, 11, 12, around there. It says, in such were some of you. You're no longer that way. You're no longer that way. And it talks about what is very accepted today in our society as being, this is acceptable. And the Lord is saying, before me, it is not acceptable. You need to know this. It is not acceptable before me. You have choice to do what you want to do. It's not acceptable before me. Look at what it talks about the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And this is a... If you are in a position where something has happened to you or you've made a decision that is not good and it may be fairly permanent at that point, sexually. Look at what it says here. So the eunuch, this man here, probably was sexually put in a place made to be the way he was. Whether, whether it was his decision, perhaps. Maybe it was his decision. But it offered him to be in a position that was, well, let's read. So the eunuch answered Philip. Actually, let me just go back a few verses just so we get a picture of who this individual was. So this is Acts chapter 8. And I, I just... I don't have it here in my notes, but I just want to go back a few verses just so you get to know who this man was and where he was from. And because of this man, let me just say this, the, because of this man, Christianity began in Ethiopia, which was probably much larger than Ethiopia of today, okay, was a, covered a huge territory in, in uh, northeastern Africa, I believe. And... So, let's go back. I, I just so we get a picture of this. And I don't know why I'm going in, because uh, I had not intended to go into this. But, but just in this last week, there was conversation. And, I, and I, so I want to share this. And even if it's for those that might be online, I just want you to know that God loves the sinner. And God desires for relationship to be made right with him. And I'll tell you right now, it doesn't have to be a sexual sin, but it is whatever sin. It says we have all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. And God is saying, but I've made a way. Yes, the wages of our sin, the payment for one sin is eternal separation from God. Our wages of sin is death. But God is saying the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so in this negative statement of, of, of uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that same verse contains the fact that God is saying, yes, that's our wage. Our wage, my wage as a pastor without the Lord, even before the Lord, even with, with the Lord, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so if you are in a place and you know this is not right before the Lord because the Holy Spirit, it's not man coming against you, but even within your own 
conscience, the Holy Spirit is saying, this is not right, and you know it's not right. And here the Lord is saying, there is a way out. Verse 26, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. We know where Gaza is, right? This is desert. So he arose and went and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. So he, he had great rank under this queen, Candace, of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to worship, or come to Jerusalem to worship. So all her treasury, like this, this queen was extremely wealthy and powerful. And the one thing that he, had char in, he was in charge of was the finances and treasury, and he was a eunuch. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said, and he's reading from Isaiah 53. Do you, not, do you understand what you are reading? As Philip questions him, he's right beside him. And he's running along, he's jogging along. Hey! You know what you're reading? You understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? I understand, how, unless someone guides me. And he asked Philip, and I'm sure Philip was saying, I don't know how long he was running beside, but it's like, hey, uh, I've got the answer. And, he's, and he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began, beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Isaiah 53 written about 700 years before Christ, is about Jesus coming. Like a powerful, powerful prophetic word of Jesus coming and dying for us. Then Philip opened his, uh, okay, I read that already. Verse 36, and, and going on, now listen very carefully. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? So, along with the gospel, Philip talks to him about baptism, water baptism. Then Philip said, and this verse 37, if you have an NIV, is not in your Bible. That's why I don't really care for the NIV. It leaves passages out. It says, then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, for those that maybe have struggled or made decisions. And this man, I don't know what caused him to be a eunuch, whether it was by birth or whether it was by man, by his own decision or not. This man got saved and impacted many because he prob probably told Candace, the queen, this is what happened. You need to know about Jesus. And as a result, there are many uh, believers that came out of or came as a result of, of this and a church in Ethiopia or the body of, or churches as people got saved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I thank God 
that God's heart is to restore relationship with him, even if we've messed up when it comes to sex before or during marriage. I just, I want you to know, and I, I know maybe there are those, once again, online as well, where you know, man, hey, sex before marriage happened. The world, that's what the world does. Sex outside of, of marriage, been there, done that. This is what the world does. I want you to know, even as you would examine yourself and you recognize, man, I, that's where I was at. As we come before the Lord and, and we say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. So be in the world, it's not sin. It's, it's accepted. But according to the word of God, the God desires for you to have opportunity to have relationship with him, even if you have sinned sexually. In fact, perhaps some of you have sinned up here in your head. There's not been relationship with anybody else, but it's been up here or in your heart. And so here the Lord would say, hey, and he says, even those that would lust after a woman in their heart or lust after somebody in their heart have already committed adultery. Lord, forgive me. And so when it comes to the, the sexual nature uh, of, of your past that has not been right before the Lord, I want to encourage you today that God forgives as we come to him and we confess our sins and we repent. Lord, I will not do this again. I will not do this again. And you're going to help me to live a life that is right and holy before you. In Hebrews 13, verse 4, it says, Marriage is honorable above or among all, and the bed undefiled. What's happening between the married uh, coupled is honorable, and the marriage bed is undefiled. Say, thank you, Lord. This is what the Lord has instituted within marriage. Say, this is going to happen within marriage. That's why if you're single, you wait until you are married. When it comes to the sex between a man and a woman, According to what Jesus said, it'll be between a man and a woman. It says fornicators, that would be those that would have sex before marriage, and adulterers, sex as a married individual, but is outside of your marriage or your spouse with somebody else. It says God will judge. He will judge. And once again, I say to you, while you are still breathing on this side of heaven, you have opportunity to make things right, make them right. Now, we're talking about these last days. Tell me if there has not been seducing spirits impacting people. Like we are talking a major attack on the family unit. We're a major attack on marriage that is demonically inspired and we see the impact of it in our day and age. I want to say this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful. Romans 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, let me just, uh, I, I want to say just a few things that are a result of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, this is what can impact a person, and it, it probably has impacted you, and there's been a, a change in your life as a result of hearing the gospel and responding to the good news of Jesus Christ. Gospel means good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God to save salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew, the, the, the religious first, and also for the Greek. 
the intellectual. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of God imputed to us as we believe. That's what faith is, to believe. And in, in this case, I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death or his death on a cross for us. As it is written, the just, those that are right before God, shall live by faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. He took our sins upon himself. So this is what the power of the gospel of, uh, can do. It produces new birth, 1 Peter 1.23. It gives, it, to give, the gospel is God's power to give salvation, Romans 1.16, we just read, and Ephesians 1.13. The gospel is God's power to impart grace, Acts 20.24. 20, the gospel is God's power to establish people in the faith, Romans 16.25. The gospel is God's power to generate faith, Romans 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and not just hearing anything, but the hearing, hearing of the word of God. The gospel is God's power to set free, John 8, 31 to 36, which says, he whom the Lord sets free, or he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. To, the gospel is God's power to nourish, nourish spiritual life, 1 Peter 2, verse 2. It is the power to cleanse the church, Ephesians 5, 26, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. It is the power to search the life, Hebrews 4, verse 12. It is the power of God to make partakers of Christ, Ephesians 3, 16, or 3, 6. It is the power to impart immortality, to live forever, 2 Timothy 1, 10. It is the, God, the, the power of God to bring peace, Romans 10, verse 15. It is the power of God to give protection, Ephesians 6, 17. It is the power of God to give fullness of blessings, Romans 15, verse 29. When God is rejected, darkness is accepted. Let me say that again. When God is rejected, when Jesus Christ is rejected, darkness is accepted. Let me just go on from verse 16 and 17. Listen to the rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the outcome. Listen. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They don't accept the truth. They're going to suppress it in unrighteousness. Things that are not of righteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them just looking at themselves and who they are and how they've been created, they can see that there was a creator. And so God is manifest in them and to them, for God has shown it to them who God is, and they suppress. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, say, no, it's not. It all evolved. Everything else has a designer and creator, except for the most complex being, and that is man. We evolved from nothing. That's what the world says. So his invisible attribute, attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. No excuse. Because although they knew God, they knew there was a God, they did not glorify him as God. God, you're out there, but we're not going to glorify you. Nor, nor were thankful, but became futile or useless in their thoughts. Tell me that this isn't happening today. The thoughts that are out there that is acceptable, and this is, we're supposed to be saying, yep, this is, this is normal thought processes and whatever, their thoughts became futile. They became futile or useless in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men or man. So what they... 
This God that is of eternity, is immortal, and is incorruptible, is, is without, is, is perfect in all his ways. They made God into an image. Let me give you an image of God. This is an Im image that man has made. God is good. God loves me. And because God loves me and he's good, I'm not that bad a person, so he will not put me apart from him. Now, this is making God in your own image, in the image of man that would say, you know what? This is how I see God. Well, that's not how God is. I'm not a bad person. So, of course, he's going to allow me to spend eternity with him. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to Father except through me. There is no other way. Even his eternal power and Godhead were clearly seen. So that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened, as I read. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. So they're, they're, we're talking even making idols, uh, and they worship these idols. And whatever that idol may be, this is my God. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts. Hmm. Let me just finish reading here. To dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They gave, God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creature creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. This thing of giving them up to uncleanness is a physical uncleanness, or in the moral sense, the impurity of lustful thoughts and living according to their lusts, physically and mor mora moral morally. All right. So not only did he give them up to uncleanness, you want to not, you're going to say, hey, I don't exist. All right, I'm going to, I know you exist, but I'm not going to acknowledge you. And so the Lord gives them up to uncleanness, or God gives them up to uncleanness. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, not just to uncleanness, to lustful, impure motives, but he also gave them up to vile passions or depraved passions. And we're talking, well, he's going to explain now. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what it is against nature. So naturally, a woman, one of the things is when there is sexual relation with a man, the natural state of being would be, depending on the time of the month, that the woman gets pregnant, and that's how God made things. That's the natural thing, and there's a, the natural aspect of a man or, and a woman as God intended from the beginning. Well, that's not what's happening today, once again. For those that are listening online, you have opportunity to do whatever you want according to this world, but according to God, God is saying, these things are not right before me. I love you, and I'm telling you, these things are not right before me, and there's going to be, there's a judgment day coming. We need to make things right before that judgment day comes, because we will all stand before God. It is appointed unto man once to die, and the judgment, and the judgment will take place immediately. You'll either be with God for eternity, or you'll be separated from God for eternity the moment you die. 
if you don't make the right decisions now on this side of heaven. So God is, is saying, I care about you, and I want you to be with me for eternity. And even the people that are in this place of vile passions, God is giving them, you want to do these things? Go ahead. And God gives the person up to vile passions, for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So according to the word of God, it's fairly explicit as to what is happening here. And I'm saying to you in all love, and the Lord is saying, this is not right. Get it right. Make things right. And the Lord is saying, I want for you to be with me for eternity. Now, if you don't want to be with God for eternity, uh, don't do the things that God would have you do. Just carry on doing what you got to do or want to do. And uh, you, you will be apart from God for eternity. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they're pushing, no, no, no. I don't even want to think about God in here. I don't, I, the, the conviction and the, my conscience and, and the things that I know are right and, I, and I'm not doing them. And they're pushing God away. So God give, gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Listen to this. And I read it a, few, a number of weeks back. Listen to this and tell me this isn't for today is what's happening right now. This is an illustration of life without God. I reject God, and so darkness is accepted. Listen to this. And once again, I say this with all love. My heart is not for, for a person's demise, and God's heart is not for their demise, but for them to come to know Him. Listen, to do those things which are not fitting. Verse 29, Romans 1, 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness. <sighs> sexual immorality. What happened on October 7th, and these pictures were broadcast around the globe, where we're talking about women being raped And dying, how they died, I'm not sure exactly how they died. But to see this and to say this is this sexual immorality, this wickedness is, is prevalent. Sometimes it's very open. Sometimes it's hidden. I, hidden. I, I apparently, the sex trade is brutal. We're talking about children in being enslaved in sexual uh, things against their will. Young girls, young boys, against their will. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. It's just like being really extremely bad, evil, wicked, malicious. So these are wicked acts. Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but they also approve of others who practice these kinds of things. I'm an improve. I approve. It's okay. Wickedness. The Lord is saying, hey, while you're still breathing, you have opportunity to come around. Thank God for His grace. As we humble ourselves and repent and ask for forgiveness... But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, as we come into light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Can you imagine 
you look at yourself, you examine yourself, and you say, the stains are unbelievable. We're talking stains, and you, you try to scrub, and you scrub, and you scrub, and the, and, and you, the stain doesn't go away. And in your mind and in your conscience is the condemnation of your sin. And I want to say, you want to get rid of that, that condemnation? You want to get rid of those thoughts? You want to get rid of those things? You say, Lord... Jesus, I confess my sin to you, and you took care of it for me on the cross. I believe that you are able to wash away the stain of sin in my life. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You say, how? How can that be? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Here it is. This is how it takes place. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just as we place our faith in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. No, I'm okay. So if we confess our sins to him, immediately the blood of Jesus Christ washes us. Now, after confession, if you feel, you still feel condemnation, let me tell you where it's coming from. Satan, or the Holy Spirit convicts. Conviction brings us to a point of getting, getting things right with God, confessing our sin to, to him. That's conviction. Hey, this thing here is not right. Get it right. And so that conviction brings us to a place of repentance and right standing with God so we can be standing in the right place. But when it comes to condemnation, so you say, yes, I've done that. I've gone to the Lord, and I still have this guilt. The guilt is from Satan. Satan condemns. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ, that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no more condemnation. So you might say, well, how come I still have condemnation? Why? Because Satan is coming to you, or the demons are coming to you, and he, they're putting thoughts in your head. You're no good. What? You think? You think you're a, you're a believer? You think you're right with God? And there's always this question mark. And then there's that statement, you're no good for nothing. You're a rotten sinner. And it's so broad. Sometimes, yes, there will be a reminding of the sin. You remember when you did this, and you remember when you did that, and the thoughts come flooding back, and there's a, there's a guilt and condemnation. And I'll tell you right now, it is demonic in nature. In Jesus' name, you foul spirit. I've been washed in the blood, get lost. I take captive those thoughts that are not right before the Lord. Recognize. Hallelujah. I want you, I want you to have right standing with God. Recognize the power of the gospel to be in right standing. The just shall live by faith because of their faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Don't let Satan walk all over you. He is the accuser of the brethren. But if you've brought your sin to the Lord, I'll tell you right now, Jesus has overcome the enemy, and he's paid the price for your transgressions and your iniquities, even the tendencies you may have at this point. He's paid the price. He was wounded for our transgression. A wound is an open thing. He was bruised for our iniquities. A bruise is a damage underneath. It's hidden. You can see the result of the damage underneath with the bruise. 
the iniquities that we may have, the tendencies that we may have, the Lord has taken care of the tendencies as well. Not just the transgression, transgression, that which we've committed, but also the tendencies that we have by his broken body and blood shed for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. I just say thank you, Lord, for your tremendous sacrifice for us, your tremendous love for us today. In these last days, the enemy would come with seducing spirits and, and doctrines of demons, saying there are certain things that are totally okay. Test them in the light of the Word of God. What does, what does the Word of God say? And get it right through Jesus Christ, only through Him can we get it right. Hallelujah. I want to just close with a passage here. 1 John 1, 1 to 4. I've been reading this often the last few weeks. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. He's talking about Jesus. This is John, the disciple of Jesus. He's writing a letter and he's talking about Jesus. We have seen with our own eyes. We've heard. The life was manifest, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, eternal life in and through Jesus Christ. We saw, we were there with him for three and a half years. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, this fellowship of those that would have eternal life. We want you to have eternal life. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. That's the heart of God for you to have a joy welling up within you. My goodness, I am saved because of what He did for me on the cross. That's where my faith is at. And I've been washed and I've been cleansed in the blood even as I've confessed my sin before the Lord. And if you are in that place today, you say, oh, my sin, I've not confessed, or the sins that are, are coming to my memory, I give, I confess to the Lord, I'm washed clean. Hallelujah. That your joy may be full. Lord, I just pray tonight, as we close this service, I just pray in Jesus' name that there would be a joy that would flood over the soul of each and every one here Lord, there would be a joy that flood, would flood in the soul of those that are listening online. And even if they were in a place or are in a place, and even as they're, they're making things right, Lord, that joy and that peace and that love would just flood into their soul. Lord, that they would know my sins have been forgiven. Even the tendencies that I have, the desires of the flesh, Lord, crucified with Christ. Lord, you took care of even the tendencies the iniquities. You were bruised for our iniquities, Lord. And Lord, I pray there would be a setting free from the condemnation. And there would be a, a, a deliverance from the things of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons that says these things are okay when they're not. Lord, I just pray there would be a setting free right now from the condemnation in Jesus' name. And Lord, that there would be a joy that would flood over just knowing I am right with God. I am just before the Lord. I'm in right standing with God Almighty because of Jesus Christ, my Lord. I just pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, for my brothers and sisters here, those online, I just give you praise and glory and honor. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. And uh, we'll see you next time as we continue on uh, with this series. God bless you. It was great having you here today. If you want to listen to more messages, you can click here or here. Also, check out our website, lighthouseniagara.com, for more information and podcasts and also to give. God bless you. Have a great day.